too. And hang on to your hats. Yeah, because I'm real fast. <laughs> is, um, I wanted to ask the sound booth, is this position, oh, excuse me, about me, Michael, is this, Michael, is this where you want it? Okay, I feel so far away and yet we're so close. <laughs> There. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure it was it was all good. So uh, good morning, and um, I'm, I'm so pleased that you, that you're here. Um, I I would like to think it's to hear George or to to hear me or to see one another, but I think it's to get out of the heat, <laughs> which is all good. It's all good. Um, George knows how much I applaud his heart first and the music that breathes through him, that individualized expression of the divine. He, he sings with, with absolute heart. And, and I appreciate Holly's sweet message to each of you. They are so excited to share their greater good. And that idea that Reverend Kay is teaching them in circulation of their good we donate to their good. We had a prosperous uh, car wash with them last week and the generous donations. You know, and they could hoard that money and they could use that money and they could do it. And they, they look at it and they carefully give back to the center that supports them. So I really applaud you, the youth group, for really bringing that spiritual practice to all of us so that we can recognize how easy it is to give from that place of, of our heart. So, uh, yeah. That's, that's huge, and that's a lifelong lesson that we're all learning. So my talk today is about discovering yourself. And I start off with Krishnamurti. Do you, some of you might remember his wisdom. He was one of the modern-day mystics. And I studied a lot of him when I was first introduced to another idea beyond being a Methodist. And Krishnamurti would take some of the ideas, and he really aligns some of his thinking with Ernest Holmes and the New Thought. But he presents this idea this past few weeks as I've been home mending from my foot surgery. I came across a book in my bookshelf called Courage to Be Myself. Carlos G. Vales, and he's a Jesuit priest who studied with Anthony de Mello, who is another uh, person that I really love what he has to say and how he says it. Now, do I align with, with everything that is spoken? And I am privileged to say that we never have to. We never have to open a book and say, okay, now I have to do that. I have to do that. I have to do that in order to be spiritual. But it's, it's what you look at that suddenly just comes into your heart and you say yes to. So courage to be myself. And I had received this book way in the uh, 80s and 90s, so it was fun to see what parts I had marked in the, in the passages. But he relates to Krishnamurti, and he says this, we are a second-hand people. And I, I thought, isn't that an interesting concept? We're second-hand people. And here we're talking about being individualized, unique expressions of the one. So listen to this where he takes this thought, Krishnamurti. The thoughts, the principles, the tastes, the convictions, all of these things that we carry that begin to identify who we are, they're inherited tendencies. We have been influenced by our upbringing. Our ideas have originally, most likely, belong to someone else before us. So we begin to bundle these concepts and we begin to take things on that were other people's ideas. And sometimes we just own them without really exploring them and without really asking, is that an, a divine idea that I can hold true to that will inspire and enrich and grow my life? Or am I just allowing that idea to be a template which I need to squeeze into in order to be functioning in society, a second-hand person. 
So we've had this programmed training that has gone on through a lifetime, through lifetimes, through generations. And when I say that, is it all bad? No. We have become good people through that skillful practice. One of the stories he tells in this book that I won't um, talk a lot about, but there in the late 1800s, somebody had taken a person and kept them in a cave. And I thought, how cruel is that? That they were doing a scientific experiment. I can't imagine that with our human rights now, that ever happening now. But they, up till 18, and this individual uh, could not walk, could not communicate, could not, uh, it didn't learn any of the skills. And uh, ultimately had a very sad ending to, to that individual person's life. Uh, wasn't given choice. He wasn't given choice. He were born as the unique expressions and were given choice along the way. And when we choose along that pathway to say yes to a divine inspired thought and to say yes to a new way of being, our life changes, our thoughts change us by beginning to own some of the thoughts that you want to cultivate and allow to be birthed and expressed by means of you. So we have this program training and we end up, as uh, Krishnamurti says, as secondhand people. We're taught, educated, trained language. We're part of the wisdom of mankind. And so it, it takes something to, to develop an original thought, to have original thinking, or to, to tap into that aspect of being creative, yet it is being invited into our experience all the time to rewrite your story. I spoke about that at the first service, to, to really look at your life and say, this is how it's been going along, and this is the novel of my life, and this is the chapter I'm in. And we can get hung up. We can get hung up and not turn the page, and I, I can't emphasize that enough. You have the opportunity to turn the page, and it can be blank. And then you can turn another page, and it says chapter 10, and you get to start to script it. You see the power in that? The power to know that you've had all this wonderful life up until now, and you have these opportunities to now recreate an idea, a divine idea of you, with all that you have been gifted through the experience and the wisdom of all those before you. And we can choose to take the great spiritual le leadership and the wisdom and the scriptures and find where do I fit and where does this cause me to be alive inside myself? So it's necessary to have that upbringing, to, to cultivate that sense of who we are, to empower ourselves, to reach a certain level. But we are not confined into that. We are open at the top, as Ernest Holmes is always reminding us. So we find that we have this foundation. We have this foundation of truth that serves us well. This is the exact quote from uh, Krishnamurti. For centuries we have been spoon-fed by our teachers, by our authorities, by our books, by our saints. We say, tell me about it, because we're curious. What lies beyond the hills, the mountains, and the earth? And we are satisfied. You see, we be, sometimes we just simply become satisfied with their description, which means we live on their words. And our life becomes a little bit more shallow and a little bit more empty because we're just allowing ourselves to live on other people's principles and words. We have lived on what we've been told, either guided by our inclinations, our tendencies, or compelled to accept it by circumstances and our environment. We are the result of all kinds of influences, and there is nothing new in us, nothing that can be discovered for ourselves, nothing original, pristine, or clear. To be free of all authority of your own and that of another, Here's the important piece, is to die to everything of yesterday so that your mind is fresh, always young, innocent, filled with a vigor, filled with a passion. That's what Krishnamurti is trying to point us to, to say we are no longer defined by this idea of an upbringing. Even to be a religious scientist, we can be beyond that, more than that. We can take all of those beautiful tools die to them recognizing when we say that we die to something we recognize that the greater good the spirit of all things continues to live on so it will percolate through us it'll be part of our expression forevermore it is part of our soul and so that part never really dies all the way but how we operate 
how we choose to operate this death of an old image of ourself. Uh, Tara had shared in a class that we were taking about the imperfect imperfections, gifts of imperfection, a video of Cat Stevens and his new name, uh, New Self Islam. And it, she pointed us to go visit that. And what a wonderful, if you look that up about Cat Stevens and his journey, his path of truly deciding. I mean, here's a, here's a musician, and when I was listening to his music, it was like, like listening to you again, George, but it's the, it's the music of my, of my upbringing, of well, you know how you hear a song and you're going, oh yes, that's how I'm suffering. That's it. That's, those are the words. Oh yes, that's how they love me, even though they don't know me. And, and you, you realize how much as you invest in that music of that time, his spirit and his love and his heart. And he was very successful. But driven in him was this path, this urge to find and discover his God. And how was that going to speak to him? And it showed up through the faith path of the, of the Islamic path. And he was, you know, it, trying to die to his old image and to live to this idea that was being birthed in him to be this idea of God as expressed through this path was, was quite challenging, um, but he lived on purpose. And he, it's a wonderful tribute to, to witness and to get to process through when you look at your own self. What part of me do I want to die to my old self, my old image? And I think about this a lot in my own personal life because as we have matured in life we tend to take on all the roles that we have been and people identify her, ourselves oh she's a nurse oh she's she's a yoga teacher oh, she's a minister oh she is this or that and yet i look at i look at all of those as if there were outfits in my closet to wear and i want to show up as me you know, I don't want to fit in any of those roles, and I don't want you to show up here trying to fit in a description of who I thought you were yesterday. I want this sense of vigor and passion and aliveness as you show up here and say, how can I change my thinking, therefore change my life? And so how can I rewrite, how can I enter in the next words in this fresh page of the chapter of my life when I leave here today? I am not what I was once before. There is an idea of a story of a, of a man in India that wanted to build his dream home. And so he bought the property and he built it with all of the most wonderful, uh, most current appliances and attributes that just the most wonderful house and garden could ever have. And then when he presented it to his mother in India, the families very much take good care of themselves and the family comes along and his mother said, I don't want to live there. She wanted to stay where she, she goes, I want to die where I know myself, where, I, where I'm comfortable having been. And so he had to postpone his dream. He had to postpone his longing to be in his own life for the, for the value and the love of his mother. So you know the choices that we make are done with love, but we often postpone don't we? Who we are, what we long for, what we are, that silent, quiet urging inside of us is rocking our heart and stirring. So the struggle to find your true self, these youth that are about to go to camp, you know, this, this opportunity to, 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 to fall freely back into the arms and to have this place of trust and faith that when you decide to make this decision to, to invoke this divine idea of yourself, there's this idea of, of faith and grace that will carry you and be your companions as you recognize for yourself what the truth of your spiritual journey has been. You know, Gandhi's son, everybody in the world had put Gandhi on such a pedestal and praised him for his life's work. But you know, in, in the family, his one son totally denied it and didn't want anything to do with the identification of his father. When I start to talk about this, I act like I'm from India. And so, <laughs> no, but he, he took, 
he took this idea of Gandhi's son and he said, I don't want anything to do with that. And so he did everything he can to make a black mark on his, on his father's name. And he lived a very sad and lonely life. So it's, it's interesting what he tried to die to, but his choices that he placed in, in, in front of him were all of the things that would um, cause him great, great suffering in his, in his lifetime. So this struggle, this idea of finding your own convention, and sometimes we try to rebel against an idea of who we are. And so you recognize these principles that Ernest Holmes is always reminding us of, those two powerful emotions of hate and love. They must, they, they, they paint our life. They color our experiences. The emotions that we infuse ourselves with are going to be out picturing in our thoughts. So what am I asking you to do? I, I'm asking you to go into a place where you sit very quietly and you invite that sense of idea, that in divine idea of who you now choose to be. Let yourself bless the past, but do not live and dwell and let that be the precedent for what you are about to experience in your future. And so again, here's the other idea of living present moment. We are inviting you the true principle, I now choose to operate from this present moment, to see my life. I love this idea, to look with eyes of purity, to open my eyes, to open my heart, to let my eyes see from the temple of my heart all of the best that I have learned, all of the good that I have found on my journey, my journey that I know because I've experienced. It is my story. It is my love. It is my truth. Let that percolate up and let my pure eyes glance around at my present moment, recognizing any distraction that is less than that, and dig deep, dig deep until it is uprooted and it is seen for what it needs to be seen for and released forevermore, blessed and released, forgiven and forgotten. And you realize when we're operating from this place, we have this opportunity to re-script our life, to be empowered from this day forward to be individualized God sparks throughout the world, offering a greater idea of who we are. So we, we can look into the past and keep repeating those stories because we're not being very mindful. And then we create masks, and then we create generations of people with these masks on. So we must encourage this personal reflection. That's what all the classes are about that we invite you to. That's what every opportunity, every seminar, every opportunity to be in the presence process is inviting you. We encourage you, please personally reflect on who you are. And with that adult sense of awareness, practice that idea of who you are with great faith, great conviction. We want to surrender um, some old beliefs that have confined us. It's so interesting on my journey because many pathways of yoga have taken me to you need a guru when you're studying that. And I've always said, I'm not ready for that. And it was very interesting to read this again after many years of kind of being in that space of I've always felt less than because I have not accepted a particular one guru into my life experience, though I have blessed the wisdom and the truth and the teaching of so many. And so I just felt like, um, you know, kind of a floozy, a spiritual floozy out there, just like, <laughs> yeah, I dig what you're saying and you too, you know. I'll pretend I'll put you on my altar. And so I got this <laughs> altar of all these great beings. And, and I'm thinking, you know, it really needs to come from with, within me. Because I can be so paralyzed. I can be so paralyzed. I had a yoga studio once, and we invited some Buddhists in that had the Red Tara practice. And I had to be there to keep the studio open for them. So I was participating in the practice. And I went, geez, it was a long practice. And there was hundreds of prostrations. And I thought, gee, how can I do that? Breathe my breath, do so many breaths out my nose and move my hand a certain way. That's the yoga practice that I was trying to incorporate every day. How many salutations to the sun can I in, in, include? And then oh, you do all this work. And then, then they say, sit still then for a half an hour or an hour. I'm thinking, yeah, you got to get to work. And, <laughs> 
and so I would just lay there and the alarm would they say, and the most auspicious time is five o'clock. I don't think so. It was, that's a time I'm really sleepy. And so I would just think, oh, I've got all those nasal things to do and the neti pot and the tummy things and oh, and some aerobics and ride the bike. Uh, never mind. I think I'll just sleep and bluff my way through that. You see, you, you we're, but all of these teachings are really not asking you to bow and to surrender to somebody else's idea. You know, those pathways worked for the person that's telling you to do it. So do it if you want to. See how it feels. But you don't have to. The only have to is to discover for your own self what practice instills that sense of knowing. What stillness will invoke that idea when you open your eyes and they are pure eyes and you suddenly see more clearly, you're more divinely inspired. So you're doing your own thinking and you're allowing this idea of yourself to do it on your life's terms, putting this old image behind you. So we want to allow this old image to be set free, cease to be. It's like a, in, the, in the author's writing, it's a bondage to a clay image that we created in the first place. And sometimes that image was created from an insecure mind. It wasn't even created from a real powerful mind. It was like, I'm going to hide behind you know, this particular yogic outfit because they'll think that I'm even better than I am. And the truth be told, suddenly the true self of you will always emerge. You'll, it'll, it'll always be told the truth of who you are. It'll always be revealed. So quit hiding and be yourself. Tell the truth. So this, this idea, it takes great exercise and courage, like I was talking about you, stop. Trying to be that, that sense of, of who he truly is. And um, it took great courage for uh, Reverend Dr. James Golden to be his true self. It took great courage for Reverend Dr. Andrea Golden as a beetle to be her true self. It takes all of us great courage to, to accept someone else's idea of their greater self and get our small self out of the way. Is that true? Can you feel that? Can you feel that kind of make you go, oh, she mentioned something that I'm uncomfortable with, or I don't even know what she's talking about because she wasn't here then, not important to me. You see, it's just what's stirring you, what's, what's stopping you, what's blocking you. Get out of your own way and allow this moment to be an absolute pure moment that allows yourself to follow these gentle leadings, that allow you not to be the slave of your old ways, but allow yourself to be set free. So he, he writes in this book, I must free myself, even from myself, if I want to advance along the path of life and find new horizons. The stories are within us, but no freedom if we are bound to them because we want them to identify us. Okay, don't be bound by a story just so you have some kind of identity, just so you look really cool or you've had this really powerful experience, therefore you are so-so. It, it means nothing. What means more is who you are in this day, so we're not programming our future by ideas that we've held so firm in the past. We want to make change happen almost by itself. And I love this idea, how it was, in, it was presented. There is, if we stay in contact with and allow that vivifying sap of divine grace to flow into us in the silence and peace, this is where real growth takes place. Be fully where you are. Do what you're doing. Be what you are in your soul and awaken to the freshness of the moment. And not being impatient or trying to force change. It's like remembering the analogy of the caterpillar and the chrysalis and the, and the butterfly. You can't squish the caterpillar into a chrysalis and then just say, okay, what's happening? And peel it apart and expect a butterfly wing to pop up. It takes this grace. It takes this time to allow that natural nature, that natural flow to reveal the greater truth. So as you continue to turn your pages and turn your story, keep reminding yourself you are the author of your experience. So remember, this is what was happening 
to me just a few minutes ago. I was trying to remember the name, and now I can say it because it's Craig and he's here somewhere, because I'm excited because you're doing music in July. And I was trying to share that with the sound, with Roger, I almost forgot his name, and I was like, oh, struggling. And I thought, I can't remember it. And that's just what this talk is. When we struggle, when we try, that which we want to know and to express just disappears. And then every, all the characters that even, I don't even know if Roger was listening to me, they're all gone. But then you kind of go, oh yeah, it was Craig. Uh, Craig. And then it comes back to, that's how change happens. That gracefully. Do you get that? That gracefully. When we let go of trying to steer it, trying to take such charge of it that it's forced a certain way. No. There's this divine grace, this desire to just allow it to be. And then the memory, everything that is allowed to be expressed just floats forward. We're not forcing it or imposing it. So this, this affirmation, let me fully be what I am today, and I shall wake up anew to a world tomorrow. So in closing, I had this great story. Maybe I'll share it like, like a, um, an afterthought, because there's this great story about two cups of tea. And I need to close now to, to honor the honor the uh, commitment to speak just so long and let you go if you need to go. But this idea of following the distractions of your own mind, do not curse them. Present moment means if you've got them, follow them. They are gentle guidance. They are leading you deeper into your heart, deeper into a place where that divine spark has been gifted into you and has enlightened your soul and is speaking to you and asking you, beckoning you in to dwell there, to sort out all the confusion and to know that when your eyes open with pure eyes, you will see clearly the direction your Lord of faith has for you, your Lord, your truth, your God, your spirit, your love. And when you operate from that aspect of beingness, the whole world moves with you. And you are blessed, and you are a blessing. So join with me in this knowing as we recognize this opportunity today that we leave with grace, and we see with pure eyes, and we're undistracted. so many opportunities to speak truth, to be truth, to stand in truth. Right here, right now, we all get out of the way. We allow our hearts and eyes, minds and beings to lift up and to receive that divine grace, that divine good, that divine knowing, that indeed we are a unique and individualized expression of this truth. What was in our past has blessed our way, has been rose petals now on our journey forward. What is in our future, we each now choose to pay close attention to our thoughts, to our mind, as it now is the creator, the divine creation moving through us by means of our thoughts, recognizing and establishing ourselves in that absolute one truth that it is done unto us as we believe. So we choose here today to believe a higher good, a higher truth, a greater truth, of ourselves and thereby that truth expressing and moving and allowing its love to flow easily and gracefully without any blocks into all those we meet upon the journey. So thank you God for this moment, this blessing, this time to simply sit together knowing that we are one 
and that there's an individual aspect to our being that is now willing to live this truth, to operate from this truth. So our book will never close. It is forever open and we're ever scripting that greater truth. Thank you, God. I leave this word now knowing that it is spoken in truth, spoken with heart, and received in love, and so it is. Thank you.